Welcome to the calm amidst the chaos of COVID that is Virtual Church. Great to have you with us. We've got a new departure today. We're starting off a new series on people who met with Jesus. And our first person is Nicodemus. I love Nicodemus, partly because he's the only Irishman named in the Bible. Nick Odemus. Sorry. Uh, but also because there's something about him that reminds me of my own testimony of how I came to faith. Something tugging at me that said, there, there must be more. Somehow my life isn't complete and fulfilled. Something's missing. And I think that's what propelled Nicodemus towards his own meeting with Jesus. Anyway, let me read now from John chapter 3, and you can see what you think about it. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling, ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes to the light. Well, those final remarks of Jesus there are very apposite because uh, it tells us at the beginning of chapter 3 that G Nicodemus came to see Jesus by night. So he's saying, what are you doing, Nicodemus, creeping about in the dark? What are you hiding from? And in fact, Nicodemus had a lot to lose by coming to see Jesus. So he is, we're told, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He's sort of an MP, a, a cabinet minister, but like a bishop as well, rolled into one, because at least in its theocratic days, days ruled by God, uh, before the Romans muscled in and they were ruled from Rome, well, uh, the religious leaders and the political leaders were the same thing. 
So they've got a lot to lose if their establishment, uh, religious and political establishment, gets undermined. Their prestige might go. There are actually a lot of people around the time of Jesus who were claiming that this person or that person was the Messiah. Some people asked John the Baptist, are you the Messiah? And um, there was a group called the Essenes. Uh, a lot of archaeological uh, discoveries have been made about them. The Dead Sea Scrolls started with them. And they said that a, a hero of righteousness would arise and the sons of light would then throw off their oppressors, and probably meaning the Romans. So you can see the Romans weren't going to like it. Pontius Pilate, the governor, was going to get very upset with them if they chased off after one of these crazy new messiahs, as they might have seen them. They were tasked with holding the delicate balance of power between the needs of the people, the religious demands of the temple, and the Roman authorities. Very difficult, because if the people got too fanatical about anything, the Romans would come in and break up the whole thing. But if they went too far on the sides of the Romans, then the people would see them as traitors. So had to be very cautious. There was a lot to lose if they let their delicate political balance get upset. And that's why most of them didn't have anything to do with Jesus. But Nicodemus wanted something more. He knew somewhere inside him that there had to be more from God. And that's why he went in search of Jesus. We know God's up to something and he's at work in some way through you. But we know you're a teacher. That's why he calls Jesus teacher. We know you're a teacher come from God. And God's with you. That's why you're doing these signs. A very important word, by the way, uh, in John's Gospel. They're signs. The miracles that Jesus did that point to who he really is. He senses that Jesus has got something to do with There's something more that the religion he's pursuing at the moment hasn't succeeded in delivering to him. But Jesus as actually happens so often. We love to think of Jesus as being gentle, meek and mild. He's very abrupt. He jumps straight in by making a high demand of Nicodemus for radical change. I tell you the truth. This is the Amen I say to you. Amen I tell you that we actually looked at in the last session that Jesus uses all the time. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. I'm not here. God hasn't sent me into the world to have nice religious debates, to talk about uh, the content of my teaching, or even to discuss the meaning of the signs. God's actually sent me to change lives. And he's describing that change in the most radical way. It's like starting your life all over again. This is too much for Nicodemus. How can this be? He asks. We're not talking about going back into mother's womb, are we? So, so, so what's going on? And Jesus says that you have to begin life in a new relationship with God through the Spirit. This whole passage is very Trinitarian. It talks about God the Father and what he's doing, about the Holy Spirit and the change that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into our lives. And it talks about uh, the Jesus, the Son of Man, who's going to be lifted up, as we shall see in a minute. God's work always seems to be Trinitarian. The three working together uh, as one God, working together to save and rescue the human race. And fundamentally, Jesus speaks about the moving of the Spirit as releasing control to God, letting go our control of our own lives. It's very easy, if you're a Pharisee, to keep God under wraps, to follow all these rules, and therefore God had to keep his side of the bargain, and therefore you were a righteous person, and God owed you. And religion 
suddenly becomes your possession. You own it instead of God. So this is, this is radical uh, for somebody like Nicodemus, who's supposed to be at the, the sharp end, the top end of, of Jewish society, religion and politics. So the wind blows wherever it pleases. You can see what it's doing, but you can't tell what it's really up to. It is God himself. You can't make God obey your controls. It's, I'm talking about something where God is taking charge of you and your life. It's very important in this passage about the spirit and the wind blowing wherever it, it wants to, to identify that these are actually the same word in the Greek language in which the Gospel of John was written, uh, the word pneuma, and uh, that means both spirit and it means breath and it means wind. Just as the Hebrew word ruach meant all those three things. So you've got to let go being in charge of Israel and let God take charge of your life and receive new life as a gift from him. And Nicodemus really uh, doesn't get it. And so, so Jesus says, you've got to uh, reach out to me in a fresh way. I'm speaking of heavenly things. You don't even understand earthly things. Not that the Holy Spirit is earthly, but he wants to do this work in human beings, in earthly people. However bruised, battered and broken the world has become, God has not let go of his purposes for the world. He sent his son and he's sending his spirit to get there. Now Jesus quotes what, for those of us who um, aren't perhaps too familiar with the Old Testament, might seem a very obscure passage. Uh, the Son of Man uh, must be lifted up. So just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So this is describing an incident from the Torah, uh, where the people of Israel have uh, newly escaped from slavery in Egypt and are making their way through the desert to the Promised Land. And um, they do some naughty things, and they're punished. So the scriptures tell us that a plague of snakes is sent amongst them. Some of them get bitten, uh, and, and it, it's all very horrible. Moses cries out to God for mercy, and uh, God says, make a model of a snake and hold it up a, on a pole, and everyone who looks to this model snake uh, will be healed of snake bite. And of course, it's a faith thing, isn't it? I don't, I don't need to look at a, a sculpture. I, I need antivenom, you know. But this was actually a faith thing to to look to God to bring healing and forgiveness. And Jesus says the Son of Man will be lifted up in the same way. Now we know from elsewhere in John's Gospel that by being lifted up, Jesus is talking about the cross. He says somewhere uh, that. The Son of Man must be, uh, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw everyone to him. And it then says explicitly, he said this about the way that he was going to die on the cross. So the way forward into these things, to be born again, to start all over again in life, is to look to the cross of Jesus. It hasn't happened yet. It's still to come. Uh, more about that in a minute. Uh, but he's saying this is the only way forward. It has to come from God. God's healing, God's forgiveness, God's love and mercy are the things that will renew your relationship with him and allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. And so he says he hasn't come to judge the world, to, but to bring forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, like uh, the snakes being sent in the Old Testament to bring punishment and, and, and bringing death, but to save the world. And then he says, 
that this is the nature of judgment, not because God judges us, but because God offers us salvation through faith in Jesus. And if we refuse it, then we've actually judged ourselves. God's light comes into the world. This has been John's thing ever since chapter one of his gospel. The true light was coming into the world. And yet, um, people, he came to his own and his own wouldn't receive him. But to all who would receive him, he gave the power to become children of God. And that power is the power of the Spirit by which we are born again. So by reconciling us to God through his cross, Jesus enables us to enter into new life with him uh, through the gift of his Holy Spirit. So this is an exact picture of what's happening in Nicodemus's life now. He's come to Jesus in the darkness. He's hanging on to God, to religion, as something he can control. Jesus is saying, let go. Let go to me and see yourself as someone who's dependent on God for mercy and for life. And put your faith in what's coming. And yes, the cross hasn't happened yet, but the um, uh, prefiguring of it is there in the Old Testament, in the story of the serpent and of the Passover lamb and in so many other ways in the Old Testament that Nicodemus should have known and be able to identify. So as ever with Jesus, it's what about you? It's not just about uh, theology. It's not just about religion in some sense of uh, activities that you do that are under your control. It's about letting go to God, receiving his mercy in Jesus Christ and being transformed by the Spirit. This is exactly what Jesus said, uh, isn't it, in the other Gospels when he asks, who do people say that I am? They come up with various answers and then he says, what about you? Who do you say I am? Meeting with Jesus is never just an ordinary event. It's the sharp end of God's purposes deciding who's going to receive God's mercy and who isn't by our reaction, by our response to him. If we think I want to hang on to everything that's mine, 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 then we'll be saying no to Jesus and that will have consequences. And if we actually say none of this stuff is fulfilling my inner need for something, even if I can't put my finger on what it is, and we let ourselves be drawn to the light, then we come out on the other side with that question. Well, what did Nicodemus do? John actually doesn't tell us in chapter 3, but he goes on to show us that Nicodemus is still asking the question in chapter 7, verse 50. So the a ruling council are having a debate what they're going to do about Jesus and how they're going to how they need to get rid of him and of course eventually they succeed and Nicodemus speaks up and says surely our Lord doesn't allow us to condemn someone without hearing their side of the story first quite right Nicodemus um, and of course they sneer at him uh, do you want to be one of his disciples as well still hasn't gone away. He's still torn between his responsibilities as a member of the cabinet and his desire to find that something more which he suspects Jesus may have. But even more, we find it in the story of the death and burial of Jesus. So after Jesus is dead, Joseph of Arimathea, but goes and asks Pilate for his body because he wants to put Jesus' body in his own tomb. And he brings with him a friend. And that friend is Nicodemus. Nicodemus has seen the Son of Man lifted up like the snake 
in the wilderness and he's made his choice and he decides even though it's going to cost him he decides to choose Jesus I hope that's been our choice that we've chosen the light instead of hanging on to the darkness let us pray Dear Lord, thank you for this story of Nicodemus. Lord, we bring to you our own questings for something more, to find the significance that will give us meaning and purpose for our lives, to find the love with which the God who is love is reaching out into a dark world. Please, Lord, help us to open our hearts to your questions, to the challenge of who you are. Help us not to let you pass by without taking hold of your mercy. And please, dear Lord, Fill us afresh with the spirit of your Son and help us to be open to the breathing and the blowing of your Holy Spirit wherever that might bring us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a quick reminder then at the end of our virtual church today that this weekend St Andrews are going over to St Michael's to take part in a joint service with them. So it'll be their place but at St Andrews time 11 o'clock if you're from St Michael's don't come at 9.30. There have been several cases of Covid uh, affecting people from St Andrews. So may we request please that you take a COVID test before you come to church and a special request from Carolyn, the church warden at St. Michael's. She would like to know who is coming. So if any COVID is brought with us, we can inform people who were there uh, to, to take any necessary precautions. Thank you very much. And until we meet again, may the light of the Lord shine upon you and fill you with his peace.